Beloved, our text for meditation is the gospel lesson that we just shared together. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May his love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Beloved, I am convinced as we get into this text that the problem with the church is that we have a warped understanding of what love is. We have a warped understanding of what it means to be called by God to have a word. Is there anybody in the building that would say incest is okay? Kind of tight right now, right? I want you to take something into consideration. <clears throat> we currently, and, and, and this is not politics, I just want you to understand where we as a society have gone wrong. We currently have a vice president who will not attend events where alcohol is served without his wife. We have that same vice president who will not go to dinner with a woman without his wife. And as a society, we call him sexist. Karen Pence's presence in the White House is so profound. The covenant relationship they have as a marriage is so profound. Her position as a woman in the White House is so profound that your current president, when Access Hollywood got ready to drop his scandal, guess where he went first to apologize? Karen Pence. Now, no politics, I'm just watching the news. If he know enough, to go step correct at Karen Pence and apologize for his behavior, America better wake up. The church ought to wake up. But that type of behavior, we don't want to call into question. We're allowed to allow boys to be boys and behavior to be behavior because we don't want to upset or offend people. And the people we don't want to upset or offend are usually in our family. And so by love, I'm not going to say anything that's their business. Let me ask you a question. Scripture tells us 70 years, 80, if I have the strength, we do have people who make it to their 90s and 100s. Nancy Sinatra Sr. just died at 101. It happens. And so we, we understand that this happens. 101 years, I think we would all argue, is a long time. But I submit to you that eternity is a lot longer. And I'm not a mathematician. And so we are going to, out of love, allow people to wallow in sin and risk going to hell. Because I love you. I don't want to upset you. And so I will allow behaviors to be behaviors, although they are contradictory to Scripture. As sure as my name is Brian Reeves, I have to tell you today that today's text is very difficult because it calls us to speak the truth in love. I listen to people criticize and judge and talk about others and they do it in a multiple blend suit. Do you not know that your scripture in the book of Leviticus, the 19th chapter, tells you not to crossbreed fabrics? So you sitting there with your cotton polyester blend t-shirt on, <laughs> you sitting there with your cotton polyester suit on, condemning other people, and you just on that same train, and y'all ain't going on no midnight trip to Georgia. But we don't want to talk about that because we don't know scripture. But the fact of the matter is, that's today's text. We still are called to hold people accountable to scripture. Because the fact of the matter remains, regardless of how I feel about it, regardless of what you feel about it, God is not dumbing down his standards for us to be comfortable. Yes, dear friends, being this bold in Christ is going to cost you something. 
Today's text is one of those texts that people really don't like because we've convinced ourselves that every time you come to church, the church is supposed to make you feel good. There's supposed to be a nice little ring of message and I'm supposed to go out here uplifted. Well, dear friends, we're supposed to preach to you the law and the gospel, and sometimes you might have to wait a moment to hear the gospel because the law has to crush us in its totality. Please understand some very realistic things about this text because we also want to believe that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and Scripture itself was not engaged in the socio-economic political discussions of the day. We are talking about Herod today. There's argument whether he's just the tetriarch or the king. We are talking about a political officer today. And the political officer could be wrapped and ripped from any headline you want to read. Herod divorced his wife and his current wife divorced her husband and now they are married to their sister and brother-in-law. Anybody got a problem with that? But they're family, so we ain't going to say nothing because we love them. And that bothers us. But Herod is married to his sister-in-law. That's just all. Ah, types of nasty. And then he goes on to have a party. And at this party, it's believed that that would be his daughter slash niece, comes in and, see, many people in, in, in efforts to try to water this down want to make it kind of nice because kids come to church and we don't want to disturb families and make parents have to teach that much. She came in and at the party made everybody happy. Now, I just told you, it was already some messed up stuff going on anyway. And everybody at the party happy, so happy that the man promised the girl half of his kingdom. Uh, Buzz, this ain't no ballet recital. I'm just saying we'll stop right there. I don't want you to have to teach too much on the way home. I'm just saying. Half of the kingdom. So right off the bat, we've got some funny stuff going on in the family. We've got uh, all types of moral decay and now he's willing to offer half of the kingdom anything she wants. She goes and says, Mommy, I don't know what to want at this age. What do you want? This man is... And the mother, because she is so upset that John the Baptist spoke, Thus saith the Lord, over her situation, she says, Bring me the head of John the Baptist. And so the little girl then goes and says, you know what I want? Like mother, like daughter. Bring me the head of John the Baptist. So what as the church are we supposed to do with this? Allow me to take you to Luke chapter 7, verse 28. Because it's going to cause us to wrestle with what it means to be in service to the kingdom of God. I tell you, this is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ speaking. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than... Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This puts us in a very difficult situation, right? None is greater than John the Baptist. And today's text tells us that John the Baptist got beheaded. Well, <clears throat> Lord, I don't want to sign up for that ministry, right? It's going to cost me my head. Do we really wrestle with whether or not ministry cost us something? Saying something to people cost us something. But I didn't sign up for that. It's too offensive. And it's much easier to just go to the family reunion and look at them sideways and talk about them in the car. Because we love them. And they weren't raised like that. But nobody wants to say anything because that's going to hurt. And then I'm going to be viewed as the outsider. I'm going to be viewed as the Bible thumper. And I don't want to do that. It's not comfortable to do that. It's much more comfortable to sit in my house and turn on the news and shake my head and get around the select few people 
than to honestly say what God wants us and needs us to say. And why is that the position? Because let's tell the truth. We don't want to be disliked by our friends. We don't want to be disliked by our neighbors. It's a very interesting challenge. You all as a congregation know what it means to walk with God and do things that are countercultural. It costs you something. As a manual, it cost you to have to give up who you were and your identity to receive brothers and sisters from other places. It cost you as hope celebration to be birthed out of a building and pushed into somewhere else. It cost you as Zion to do the same thing, to be birthed out of one place and put in another. And now we're here. It cost you something to keep following Christ. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. And so here we are looking at what this looks like. And I am amazed as a pastor. The other week I told you what bothers me about people going to visit other churches and the things they come back to say. But here's what bothers me just as a child of God and as a Christian. Now, I, I, I will share with you, you happen to be in the most dangerous place in the world right now because this is alive and active and we will let this be rhetorical if you want. But if we believe that this is the living, acting word of God that has authority, what it says, it does, and what it means, it means, regardless of what you or I think about it, that would be a yes. By you being here today, I assume that you agree with that. If it's in here, it's God's word. It's not up to you. It's not up to me. So here becomes my challenge. That book says some things that hurt that hurt me, that hurt you, but it is God's word. And God is using that word to conform us in some very interesting ways. As a pastor, it bothers me that as children of God, we say things like this. Yes, I know what the word says, but how do you really feel? Come again? If that's what the word of God says, he's not asking what you feel. He's not asking what I think. Brian does not have a thought other than thus saith the Lord. That's what the word of God says, as if I'm supposed to change because I think differently. If this is God and he has told us to speak something, I can't change because it makes me uncomfortable. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. Can you read that for me? We don't like to talk about things like divorce. We don't like to talk about things like adultery. We don't like to talk about things like heterosexual misbehaviors. We don't like to talk about things like homosexual behaviors. We don't like to talk about things like work infractions. We don't like to talk about people taking advantage of each other because those things rest within our own walls and we don't know what to say or how to think. If God tells us it's wrong on Sunday, it is still wrong on Monday. It's still wrong on Tuesday, regardless of what you think about it or what I think about it. It's the word of God. We have got to conform into his image and not the other way around. But that hurts me. And we're afraid of what people's reaction are going to be. The church has to recognize that it's going to be uncomfortable, but God has called us to have a backbone. And when we have a backbone, people respond. Mark chapter 6, verse 20, it's our text. Can you read that for me? John wasn't worried about Herod and what his reaction was going to be. He had a word from God. It wasn't for him to tell him, yeah, I know you getting with your brother's woman, that ain't right. And Herod the king knew enough 
to fear him and understand that he was on to something. He respected him greatly for taking the position of thus saith the Lord, even though it naturally ended, ultimately did, could mean his head. But we don't want to say anything because I don't want my kids not to come back or I want people to like me. So you mean to tell me them walking out anyway is more important to you than them catching some bad news at judgment. Please go figure and make that make sense. Do we love each other enough to say, thus saith the Lord? We can't do it based on family relationships. Well, Brian, that's just not right. Here, here's what we do. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. And we'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. That's what we want people to do, to wander away from the truth and just believe anything that people say to them and that everything is okay. At what point do we hold ourselves accountable for what the Word of God says? That means you're going to be alienated. That means that this summer, the only cookout, can you believe it, that you and I might be invited to is the one we finna have outside? Because they know Judy is about to bring the Word. And I don't want that at my barbecue, but I need it more than life itself. But we get upset and we get uncomfortable because how are people going to respond? The problem is we're trying to play God. We want to judge and make sure who, no, your problem is you forget that you're supposed to deliver the word. Drop the seed. God will take care of that because there's going to be some people when we get to heaven that you thought were there. Because he said, everybody who cry out, Lord, Lord. Do we love people enough to at least give them the opportunity to repent? It's amazing to me. Let, let me give you an example. Instead of allowing people to wander, just so you understand, I, I've shared this figure with you before. 324 pounds. I had a parishioner, God rest her soul, who told me that she knew that I was her pastor because I had a belly. And she could not listen to a pastor who was thin. My doctor said, if I don't put these pills inside of you, she will be a widow. But nobody loved me enough to say, hey, Tubby, cut that out. But now, 100 pounds later, people want to know, do I have cancer? Are you about to die? Is everything okay? I just want to talk to you. But nobody loved me enough when I was near death to say a word. Want another cookie? Pastor, what should I serve you when you come over? When are we going to eat? No, let's have this meeting walking around a track. Let's do that. But we have people who are consumed living in sin and nobody ever says, stop, there's another way. Nobody ever stops and says, that is contrary to the word of God. I'm not judging you. I got my T-shirt on. As I'm preaching to you, he ain't happy. But nobody cares enough to say, hold on. I know that might feel good right now, but I'm concerned about your eternity. Pump your brakes. But we just let people spin and spin and spin because we love them. It can't be comfortable. I love this woman enough to tell her you are walking contrary to the word of God or go see my boss. She loves me enough to say you have a problem being admonished in the faith. Here's the word of the Lord. You actually don't walk on water. We love the two of those kids enough to tell them what you are doing, what you have done is contrary to the word of God. Get right. God will not be mocked. Those things are uncomfortable because you do risk the reality of people wanting to crucify you and walk you away. You know what the problem with today's text is? We didn't hear all the gospel we want to hear. Sometimes, dear friends, that's the gospel in and of itself. Allowing people to sit in that tension that because of what we are doing, because of what we have done, we should be on our way to hell. Sit there and sit in that for a moment. Because what that allows us to do is see how much God loves us. 
Could you imagine? Could you? I, I ain't even turned it on this morning. Just think about all the foolishness that's going on right now as we sit here. If God were to say, time out, I'm done. What that would be like? But you say, no, God wouldn't do that. I ask you again. If you believe that, oh, yes, he will, need I talk to you about Noah? I don't have enough of this. <laughs> My, he, he promised it won't come like that, but, but do we speak that to people? Do we share that? Or I don't want to deal with that. Let's go to Luke chapter 12, verses 49 through 53. Can you read this for me, please? Don't be passive with this. There are some people in our families, in our communities, in our congregations, waiting for somebody to be bold enough to bring a word. Yes, temporarily there's going to be some divisions because we don't get it. And it's not that I think I'm better than you. The love has got to be there enough that I can trust you to admonish me in the faith, that you love me enough that you want to see me for eternity, that I want to see them for eternity. It's not easy, and yes, it's going to cost you something. But that's what God has invited us to do. Bring a word. Share some things that are uncomfortable. I, 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 met, uh, I was talking with them on Thursday at Bible study. I am a fan of winter. I, I love the winter for a host of reasons. But I don't need to turn on the news for you to tell me it's cold or the wind chill factor. I don't need you to tell me the opposite, that it's summer and it's gonna be a heat index. It's hot. Catch a clue. But there are people who do not know, thus saith the Lord. And we make up what we want scripture to say to fit our own situation. Speak the truth in love. Allow me to take you to Psalm 103. And in Psalm 103, excuse me, we will pick up verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. That's the message that we have to bring to people. Yes, what you are doing is absolutely wrong, but that's where I need you to see God's grace. That's where I need you to see God's love. You are dead wrong, all types of wrong, and twice on Sunday. But God is not dealing with you according to that. Uh, I just asked you earlier, imagine if God were to deal with us based on what our sins deserve. Could you imagine what kind of bad news that is? You think the doctor has something bad to say. And so we just allow people to willingly, knowingly wallow in that and not say anything? That's why I shared with you in the opening that we have a messed up understanding of what God's love is. Show people's God's grace. Let's look at this in its entirety and let's see how both of us are wallowing in sin and experience that God loves us enough to give us a few more moments to fall on our face at his feet and say, God, I am sorry. But if nobody speaks it, we just gonna sit up here and play and act like this is just something to do to come up in here in our sin shirts and be okay, then we got a problem. It's not okay. And it is perfectly fine to call a sin a sin. That is what the church is supposed to do. That is what sharing Christ in its totality means. And I'm giving you hope. 
The way I am able to give you hope is because as a sinner, I understand he is not dealing with me the way I deserve. And I got another chance to walk just a little bit closer to him. And if you just come on and keep walking, we're going to get there. But we miss that. And, and, and we want to come at you wrong and just leave it there and can't even explain wrong or can't even explain love. That's not what God is doing. So yes, today we are being invited to consider the tough part of being a child of God. To wrestle with the uncertainty of our own existence as we speak to people. And it's downright uncomfortable. But in that silence, in the beheading of John the Baptist, we see also the importance of sharing with people God's grace. You, you, you see that. He sandwiched this in between sending them out. Last week he sent them out. And he pauses, Mark pauses to talk about the beheading of John the Baptist before he tells you what happens when they come back. Because he wants us to understand what we've been invited to do. And it's not for the faint at heart. But it is for the children of God. Beloved, we have been given a wonderful opportunity to share God's grace in some very uncomfortable and pleasant times. But the text provides us encouragement that not only is the king listening, the people are listening. And God will protect you by people you never thought possible if we would simply speak the word. But I ask you, I ask you very seriously to evaluate the cost because I don't want to mislead you. There are going to be people that are calling us into question for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're struggling with that, I invite you to talk with me so that we can begin to explore scripture as to what that looks like. But no, dear friends, because of God's grace, not a single person in here is being dealt with as they deserve because God loves us that much. And so because you have experienced that grace in moments where you shouldn't have, be bold enough to share with those who are walking that same walk of shame. In Jesus' name, 